All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Skylar Tivitz is a faculty member from the Department of Architecture, and he's the director of the Self-Assembly Lab. Again, as I mentioned before, I direct you to the bios to learn a little more about it, but he's uh, been involved in a great many different things and won many awards. Uh, he teaches in co-design, he, he teaches undergrad uh, design studios and co-teaches a class called How to Make Almost Anything. Now that sounds like a pretty cool class. I, I'd be interested to find out what you, what's been made or attempted to be made. Um, and then uh, among many others, uh, recently awarded a 2013 Architectural League Prize, the Next Idea Award at uh, Ars Electronica 2013 Visionary Innovation Award, 2012 TED Senior Fellowship Award, et cetera, et cetera. Enormous number of uh, accomplishments for, for Skylar. Uh, and just a little bit about this lab. The Self-Assembly Lab focuses on self-assembly and program programmable material technologies for novel manufacturing, productions, and construction, construction processes. So think about what we've talked about today, the challenges that we're thinking about in the future, and how this, what we're about to learn about, may be another uh, potential way to change the way our supply chains and our production processes work. Thank you very much, Skylar. Thank you. So wonderful, it's a pleasure to be here and hopefully I can convince you and, and uh, describe what we work on. Self-assembly seems like a fairly abstract topic probably. Uh, and I think historically it's an abstract topic at the human scale and at the industrial scale and that's what we try to focus on. Uh, so I started this research lab a year ago. I've been doing this research now at MIT for about six years. Um, I'm in the architecture department. I have a background in architecture, and then I came to MIT and did computer science. And uh, the way that I got into this is because in the design space, in architecture, product design, um, graphic, et cetera, computation and software is booming, or was booming and is still booming. And it's the fact that code has changed the paradigm in what we can design. So it opened up this new possibility. It evolved solutions, massive iteration, geometric complexity, et cetera. Simulation then changed the paradigm, allowed us to analyze our design solutions far better than we could have before. So computation revolutionized and is still revolutionizing design. It then went a step further, and digital fabrication, I think, is arguing that computation can revolutionize the way we fabricate things. You could change this video, and you could replace it with a laser cutter, CNC router, water jet, CNC mill, industrial robot arm, you name it. But the, the link between computation and fabrication is changing what we can make. And as I said, software is changing what we can design. Our lab focuses on what happens after fabrication, what happens after making parts. This is me assembling a prototype for six hours straight, uh, and I think it's pretty indicative of the problem that digital fabrication gives us this new freedom of complexity that everyone talks about, but we forget about what happens after we produce these super complex things. Then, they have, then we have this huge task of assembly, which is a, a major problem, and we forget about how we use these things, and what do we do with them, and what is the interaction between the user and the product. And so what we try to focus on is how can we bring computation to construction? Or how can we bring computation to the, the last phase of that, which is after materials are made, and how we assemble them, how we interact with them. And we specifically look at human scale and industrial processes like manufacturing, assembly, construction, distribution, products, and user interaction, et cetera. So this macro scale world. If you look at other people that are interested in self-assembly and reconfiguration and programmable materials, most of those are happening at nanoscales, biomedical, material science, uh, and, and maybe robotic applications. And what we're trying to argue is that there's this huge opportunity at the macro scale world to rethink the way that we assemble things, rethink the way that uh, materials can interact with their environment and the user, et cetera. And what I would like to argue uh, is that we should probably switch from a mentality of only automation to a mentality where materials can do more. And meaning we don't need to get rid of robots. We don't need to eliminate them altogether. There's a lot of advantage for automation. But if you go to almost every industry, 
people will say, well, the solution is automation. If we can just make smarter robots, then we can solve all of our problems in manufacturing. We can solve all of our issues. But I think there's a big problem there. It's ignoring the material solution and ignoring the environment around it. And, I, and what we're trying to do is allow materials to have a greater conversation. Materials are great at physics. They're great at responding to energy. And they're great in material properties, change of behavior, shape, et cetera. And so what we need to do is have machines that are good at things that machines are good at, precision, repeatability, et cetera, humans that are good at creativity, abstract thinking, et cetera, and materials that are good at physics, responding to energy and material properties. And so we need to have this dialogue. And so that's where we're switching to a mentality of smarter materials and potentially self-assembly. So self-assembly is a process by which disordered parts build an ordered structure uh, completely independently, so non-guided energy. And when we say non-guided, we mean I'm not picking up parts with myself or a robot, and I'm not forcing them into place. Sledgehammer, lots of energy, fighting tolerance, uh, this sort of brute force mentality of assembly, but rather I'm supplying noisy energy to get them excited, and through this noisy energy, they can assemble themselves. And if you look at every process outside of the human scale, this is fundamentally how things come together. If you look at biology, chemistry, physics, at super small scales or super huge scales, there aren't any molecular sledgehammers, screwdrivers, robot arms, et cetera. Right? They're, they're looking at self-assembly, how individual parts interact with their environment and their neighbors. And so what we've tried to do at the lab is focus on what are the key ingredients to utilize this process at much larger scales. The first one is really obvious, materials and geometry. So that's what we use every day. Everything is made out of material properties. Everything has shape, functionality, et cetera. The second one is interaction. Interaction is how do those parts find one another? How do they get excited? And more importantly, how do they error correct? So we utilize a principle called error correction. I'll show uh, an example in a second. But basically, it's trying to find ways that you can have weak local interaction uh, with redundant systems that guide themselves to more and more precise parts. And they weed out errors, which is exactly analogous to analog communication to digital communication. Majority voting, sending more information than necessary. So therefore, you get perfect signals from imperfect parts. So we're trying to do the same thing for manufacturing and construction. Perfect systems and products from imperfect processes and parts. And the last component is energy. And energy is um, probably the most important, and we're specifically interested in passive energy, meaning agitation, fluids, heat, sunlight, pressure, et cetera, which are super abundant, super cheap, and can be utilized to get things excited and assemble into precise shapes. So to give you an example, if you have heat, you probably want to dial in your material to respond to heat. So you may want to use metal, or you may want to use a thermopolymer, et cetera. Uh, if you lock in your materials, Let's say you need to use wood, you probably want to use an energy that wood can respond to, like moisture. And so we use these ingredients and dial in the system so that you can get active transformation. One of the first demonstrations we did was a glass flask, and you shake it hard, and the parts break apart. And then you shake it a bit softer, but still randomly, and the parts come back together to form the final structure. And so this demonstrates to me that any person can pick this up, have no idea what's in the bottle, no idea uh, how it works or what to do, and can precisely assemble this structure. But not because they're eye-hand coordination or because they know the instructions, because they're supplying random energy. It also shows that random energy can produce non-random results. Normally, we think of entropy as breaking things apart and destroying systems. And what we're trying to do is guide entropy into building useful structures so that it's easier for the parts to build something precise and useful than it is to break apart. We showed the error correction principle looking at chirality, right-handedness and left-handedness, where you dump a bunch of black and yellow parts together, shake them randomly, and you always get fully black and fully yellow. You never get half and half. And that's because if two parts connect in the wrong way, They'll work, and they'll connect a lot in the wrong way, but it's very weak. A third part can't connect there that makes it stronger, so it'll break off. If two parts connect in the right way, a third part will connect, and it makes it slightly stronger, and then slightly stronger, and then slightly stronger, so that successful structures are um, guided and, and errors are weeded out. So in that way, we can guarantee precision of the parts. This project looked 
at a slightly different topic, um, more self-organization than self-assembly. What you've seen in the past few examples was that precise parts can make precise final shapes or structures. And therefore, that's sort of a manufacturing application. You have a bunch of components, you want to supply noisy, free energy, and you want to get precise products. In this application, we're looking at crystallization and material phase change, like solid liquid gas. You want a number of fundamental components that can come together to make vastly different systems, like a solid liquid gas, ice, uh, water, et cetera. So we were trying to study fundamental structures. We looked at carbon and tetrahedral model using two positive and two negative poles, uh, and looking at what types of structures can emerge, graphite, diamond, caffeine, uh, geometrically linear chains, hexagons, pentagons, dodecahedrons, et cetera. So same fundamental components, vastly different structures based on their interaction with their neighbors and the guidance of the energy externally. So we have a 200 gallon tank of water. We deposit uh, hundreds of these objects in there. They're neutrally buoyant, so they move freely in all three dimensions. And then in the back, we have two pumps. And those pumps, we can blast the energy to break everything apart, or we can calm the energy down to allow things to assemble, uh, or somewhere in the medium where you get a vortex and you get sort of assembly zones and disassembly zones. We can also oscillate the energy, and we can create re regular patterns or more chaotic patterns. And what we're interested in here is both the local patterns and the global patterns. If you look closely throughout this video, you'll see a number of pentagons and hexagons or squares show up. But we're also interested in the global lattices and patterns that, that emerge. And we see this project in a few ways. Number one, it's an educational device that you can imagine in classrooms around the world that you have chambers like this that you can study what happens if I use carbon and I sub subject it to this amount of energy. Can I get graphene, for example? Or can I discover new material properties? Uh, and so therefore, you understand existing ones, and you turn the corner to try to discover new properties. But we're interested to go a step further, and, and we see this as sort of a future vision of where fabrication or manufacturing can go, in the sense that you have these fluid chambers, you deposit material, you subject them to energy, and they propose solutions and they reconfigure themselves into potentially optimal solutions that you may not have been able to simulate or predetermine prior. And you can link that up with simulation. So the simulation is actually analyzing what happens, updating the environment, et cetera. So if you think about a bracket in a car or a plane, or you think about a heat sink or many other structures, the normal way is that we simulate it and then we 3D print it, mill it, cast it, et cetera. And then we try to put it in the field and hopefully it works and hopefully all the energy was calculated correctly and the forces don't change. But as we know, a lot of those things are very dynamic. And so what we would like to do is deposit materials that can reconfigure themselves into highly optimal structures on the fly. And so we can see this as sort of a design and fabrication chamber in that sense. We're now trying to turn the corner and do another project based on lattices and try to build engineered lattices that you can pull out of the tank and make fully structural systems. So I'm going to turn the corner a bit and go from our self-assembly, self-organization research into our programmable matter research or programmable materials. Um, and we often are using printing, 3D printing, additive manufacturing as a way to do that. Um, but I think that we have a slightly different perspective than you've normally heard. And there's a lot of hype about 3D printing. Uh, and we're always at printing conferences or people want to talk about it. And what we find most interesting is actually the challenges that printing has, the hurdles that we need to overcome in order to utilize 3D printing in manufacturing. And I've listed some on the right here. There's probably many more. But this is what most people aren't talking about, why 3D printing is not so good right now. Because these are the opportunities we see. Number one is bed size. So as printers get cheaper and cheaper and more accessible, they get smaller and smaller, and therefore less and less useful for industrial scale applications. Some people would take the perspective, well, maybe we should build huge printers. And I argue that's not really the best mentality, because if you want to build a skyscraper, you don't want to have to build a skyscraper machine, because you might as well stop at the machine. There's no point in making the first one. Uh, the second one is maybe we could build printer farms. The problem there, though, is that if you produce a lot of parts and then you assemble those parts, there's still an assembly problem which we need to get over. And second, the parts you're producing is pro are probably worse than existing parts that we use today. 
So our, I'll show a project uh, that looks at how we compress material and print at super small, dense scales. And then we can unfold super large structures. Another one is print time, that they're extremely slow. Uh, software is an interesting one, because right now, um, one of our collaborators, Autodesk, is focused on software and, and argues that it's one of the first times in recent history that we can build things that we can't design for. Normally, you can design things, but you have no idea how to make it. It's one of the first times that we can actually make things we don't know how to design for. And a good example is multi-material printing. There's not even a file format that takes advantage of multi-material printing, not to mention bioprinting. There's no bioprinting file format that can take advantage of all the complexity there. So there's a huge advantage in software uh, development right now. Material properties. Most people will talk about we need better plastics, metals, and ceramics. And what I think is a more interesting discussion is how can we utilize 3D printing to go beyond the material capabilities today and embed multifunctional properties like logic, shape change, property change, visual appearance change, et cetera. How can we use this as a material science chamber to make new macro scale material properties? Uh, so the first project I'll show is the one looking at bed size. We did this project for Ars Electronica uh, with Form Labs, who's an MIT spinoff. And they build a low-cost SLA printer. But it's a great example because it's super high precision, but super small. Uh, the bed size is roughly 5 inches by 5 inches by 6 inches. So I think it's a, a great example of what's happening as these printers get more accessible. You can print less and less. So all of these things we found around the office that we can't print. And we thought it was hilarious. <laughs> all of these useful things, like a fish, super useful, you can't print it. Um, so what we tried to do was take any arbitrary large-scale object, uh, break it down into a single strand. You could break that into sheets or, or subcomponents. Then we break the strand down into these um, chain-like units, and each chain has a, a lockable joint. And that lockable joint can be designed to give the instructions of the final shape. So we then crumple the chain back up into a cube, and we print that super, super dense chain. But that chain has all of the instructions. So when we print the chain, it's the most dense volume you could possibly get in, in that uh, chamber. And when you pull it out, it has the instructions for the product you want to build. But you could change the final product, send a new chain. It would look exactly the same when you print it. And when you pull it out, you have a whole different instruction set. We were able to show that we could produce a 50-foot long chain from 5 inches. Here you see us having some fun in Austria, dropping it off the side of a building. Uh, what you don't see is when we dropped it and smashed, smashed the chain into pieces. Um, and then we built a chandelier. So this linear chain has all the instructions, like straight, 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 right, left, up, down, right, left, et cetera, into building this, this chandelier structure. Uh, and we think it's a great principle in order to build very large scale systems. You can imagine in space, it's very similar to the principle of folding uh, telescopes or solar arrays, that you send a machine and super dense volume of material. Out of that machine, you can pull out, basically like an extruder, you can pull out limitless amounts of material. That, and then if that material has the instructions, or even better, if that material can assemble itself, then you can get huge functional objects. So this project tries to go a step further, showing that materials can indeed assemble themselves. Uh, or at least reconfigure themselves. It was a project with Autodesk and Stratasys. Stratasys is one of the leaders in 3D printing, specifically because they have the Connex line of printers, which is a multi-material printer. Right now, you can deposit three, and they're getting to many more. Uh, super precise placement, droplet resolution in all three dimensions with vastly different material properties, and you can gradient between them. So we created this project called 4D printing. The, ide the idea was to create smart materials for 3D printing, that we want to be able to print not static objects, but active objects, like actuators and sensors, where the material transforms itself without any external control. We use this Connex material, uh, multi-material printer deposit two right now. One of them is a rigid plastic. The rigid plastic is like the um, Braille for this example. Basically, it's a geometric program that has a structure, backbones, angles, limiter. Uh, it's all the precision and all the information for what we want to fold. The other material is an expanding polymer. And that expanding polymer reacts to water. It expands 150 times 
uh, uh, sorry, 150% in, in water. And therefore, that creates the potential energy and the sensing to transform. So we have the information and the energy. We've done a lot of work to be able to go from any one shape to any other shape, uh, both in 1D, 2D, 3D transformations. Right now, the red is representing this expanding polymer. So depending on the orientation, we can get uh, linear folding, planar folding, three-dimensional folding, and a lot of calibration. So now we can go from uh, any one arbitrary angle to any other in all three dimensions. With Autodesk, we've been trying to work on a new design paradigm that allows us to design around programmable materials. Number one is, can we simulate all the things we can fabricate and vice versa? And number two is, can we design structures saying, I want a final product. I have no idea how to get there from this state. Tell me where I need to deposit materials so that I can print it and it'll get there. Um, or tell me if I print in this shape, what will I get afterwards? Um, and so we're trying to turn the corner to have both simulation and optimization for 4D printing. One of the first examples we showed was this single strand when dipped in water transforms into the letters MIT. <laughs> Some good advertising. And then we showed the letters MIT going from the 2D structure, uh, transforming itself into another 2D structure. In this case, it's the letters SAL for the self-assembly lab, but it's a bit like abstract art, so you kind of have to squint. <laughs> we'll help you in a second, I'll show you. So we showed here that we can go from any 2D to any other 2D shape. <laughs> bit of a cheat, but it was good. <laughs> And then uh, we tried surfaces. So I think surfaces show one of the greatest advantages of this technology, that you can print super fast, super cheap, uh, and then you take advantage of shipping and volume constraints. That you can produce these uh, super minimal structures and then activate it in water, and they can transform into precise three-dimensional shapes far more easily than if you printed that structure or if you, print, if you produced it another way and then shipped that structure. So it, it takes advantage of the transformation to assemble uh, either on site or in a certain environment when it's triggered. So this is a truncated octahedron structure that self folds. Another surface example, I think this one is even more elegant, that we removed all the joints and all of the angle limiters, et cetera. We print this record-like shape. Uh, with the two materials. And we dip it in water, and over the course of a few minutes, um, it eventually jumps into shape, and it produces something called curved crease origami. So all of the white parts are creases, and they fold um, mountains, valley, mountain, valley, but they're folding on a curve. So that gives you a saddle sh structure. So you go from a flexible 2D sheet into an extremely rigid 3D structure with all the precision of that structure. So you can imagine a lot of uh, origami applications here, or two-dimensional sheet to three-dimensional rigid body applications. But most of what you've seen, or all of what you've seen so far, is folding and curling. So a 2D sheet or a 1D strand that can fold and curl, uh, we had to go further and, and demonstrate stretching. Linear stretching is the only way to get double curvature, uh, at least from a flat sheet, without folding and curling. So there's a lot of applications in textiles, fashion, sportswear, or architectural applications where you have flat sheets. You want to deliver to site flat, but then you want them to be activated uh, based on their environment or their use and fold into a comfortable three-dimensional structure without forming it on site and hammering it or slaving it away. So what we can do is precisely expand every point across that surface, and by expanding it, or contracting it, we can control the, the three-dimensional um, doubly curved surface as it reacts to water. So we can get this complex curvature from a flat sheet and with precise control. One last example of the 4D printing work, uh, we rented out the Olympic swimming pool at MIT, and we built this 50-foot long strand and over the course of an hour, because we can't control the temperature of the water, it transforms 75 times in linear length. So this long strand folds itself, much like a protein, uh, 
into a complex structure. And here we're trying to demonstrate that these also could be educational devices, and we've printed a number of different protein structures, uh, but that they point towards large-scale applications and large macro-scale transformations. Okay, I'll show one more project um, that we recently did, and it talks again about printing, but this time it's 2D printing, and we're using DNA. We worked with Autodesk to develop a design tool. We take the DNA sequence, ACTG, et cetera, and we, and we synthesize a custom strand, um, or many custom strands. Then we can draw in this tool and sign these biomarkers to the designs and simulate what happens if it if I wash with one marker, I wash with another one, or which ones interact, et cetera. So it becomes a design tool to simulate this biomaterial. We worked on a couple different hardware platforms that allow us to deposit it. It's basically inkjet printing for DNA, so we can precisely deposit it. And what you're seeing here is we've printed a pattern on the white paper, and then we wash by hand with another complementary pattern, and you see MIT show up. And MIT only shows up when it meets that marker. So we're looking at DNA as a, as a basically magic ink, like a smart ink that we can program its binding with another biomaterial. And we, have, we can design custom biomaterials that respond to the environment, the sunlight, air pollution, proteins on my skin, et cetera. And by, by designing around these bindings, you can get graphics, you can get packaging, you can get inks that transform based on their environment. And so you can, uh, I guess the, the sort of holy grail example is that you have a book and depending on who's holding it or what environment you're in, the text, the images are changing. These become sort of smart displays using DNA. So we went from something similar to abstract art again uh, to the letters MIT, which you can see a bit more clearly in these images. So for me, this image points to where we are today that we have super complex things that come together in super complex ways with really intelligent people and super engineered robotics, et cetera. But it seems a bit like we're forcing everything together and that there has to be a more elegant solution to make these really smart products that we want, but allow them to come together responding to each other and responding to the environment so we make smarter systems and smarter manufacturing processes. What I think we want to get towards is this vision where we have products and systems that are responding to my demands and my needs as they change and as the environment changes. So a good example is in the sportswear space um, that if you take shoes, you have a different pair of shoes for every activity or tires in the automotive space. You have a different type of tire for every road condition. But if my shoes as I'm walking could then turn into running shoes when I start running, or if I'm on grass, they grow cleats, or when it starts raining, they close up and become waterproof or open up to breathe. These are smart products that allow me to perform better, and they're actually fluctuating based on the environment. They're not static, fixed objects that don't change for the life of them. And that means that we need to buy all of these new ones or throw them out when they're not good and, and the environment destroys them. So that means we need new materials. And we take both perspectives. We need to utilize fundamental research in material science so we can invent new materials. But we also can combine macro scale materials like plastics, woods, metals, foams, all the materials we use, combine them in smart ways, taking advantage of the energy they already react to so you can get super smart transformation. And that way, they're not any more expensive, not any harder to assemble, but they're more robust and more scalable. So in that way, we can create materials that have smarter behaviors. And in manufacturing, I think the application is more on error correction and allowing materials to be part of the manufacturing process to produce smarter systems in more elegant ways without trying to force them, fighting tolerance and energy. The shipping we talked about previously where you can uh, take advantage of volume constraints and actually ship things that then assemble later or that they regulate themselves based on fluctuating environments in the shipping environment. The, the last one is disassembly. And, and disassembly, I think, is a fascinating one where you could say materials should be able to repair themselves. We're working on some prototypes now that uh, they're sort of pipe examples that when they get punctured, a secondary layer expands and fills a hole. Um, so that they can repair themselves, and there's a lot of research happening in that domain. The second is that if you have functional systems, they should be able to reconfigure themselves into another functional system when they're not needed. 
And the third one is that if you can self-assemble, you should be able to self-disassemble for recyclability. So you can separate all your fundamental components into uh, different groups and then allow them to be recycled back into products. So we're looking at this whole uh, life cycle and how products are produced, how we interact with them, how they're shipped, and how they're recycled. So I'd invite everyone to come visit us at the lab or reach out. I'd be happy to uh, find collaborations and, and find exciting conversations. That some of the research that we're doing and sort of this magic space that we're looking at and um, somewhere between art, design, science, engineering, and how that can apply outside of academia into real world applications. And we're super eager to talk to all of you and, and find more collaborations with industry. Um, right now we're exclusively collaborating with industry and, and almost all of our sponsorship is, that, is in that direction. And I guess I'll leave, uh, we can open up to questions, but I'll leave it in a question for you guys, which I think is a challenge that we take on and really a challenge for everyone here. Um, it's not that we really know the solution, but this is exactly what we're working on. Can we design material parts with enough information and decision making that they can assemble themselves and adapt independently to internal and external forces? So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. So Skylar has a question for you. Who's got an answer for him? Or who's got another question? <laughs> you can avoid it. <laughs> yeah, OK, here you go. And reminder, just uh, state your name and a company. So Richard Roth with Hitachi. How do you foresee groups being assembled? Mm -hmm. For example, your, your shape. Once it forms up, now I want to take 15, 20 other shapes. And I want them to self-assemble. In your tank, you had an example, but it looked like magnetics. Mm -hmm. What was holding those together? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I would point to hierarchical assembly. So uh, we have a few ways to do that. One, one way that I think is interesting is probably related to biomolecular assembly. Again, that you have kind of primary, secondary, et cetera, and you assemble one structure, and then those structures assemble together into larger structures. And therefore, you can have deterministic shapes at one level. They're always going to make the fundamental building blocks. They always come out of the fundamental components. Uh, but at higher orders of magnitude, they're going to make, you can make ar arbitrary complexity. Um, because as the, those structures assemble again, they can either go again to deterministic or branch off and then respond more to the environment. So the, you can use the environment as either a purely an assembly technique or you can use it as a way to guide the types of structures that emerge. You get to think about if we start changing the buoyancy over time, or as you assemble a structure, maybe the buoyancy changes collectively, so you might start assembling sheet-like shapes, even though they're built out of these fundamental components. Um, so it's cer something we're certainly interested in doing. For the most part, we've kind of taken the low-hanging fruit that we can assemble precise shapes, so self-sort, error correct, and now organize vastly different ones. But I totally agree, uh, next steps are to show arbitrarily grouping many types of components. Um, and the other one, the other question I think you were hinting at is some of our early ones are on, uh, are using magnetics, but you can obviously use um, material properties, adhesion, um, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interaction, you can use buoyancy, uh, you can use geometric locking, mechanical structures, there's many um, static, uh, you can use many different properties to get materials to interact in smart ways. Yeah. Okay, another question? Ah, yes, Rob. Rob Fitzpatrick from National ICT Australia. Um, an attempt at answering your question, but asking you the question in response. It strikes me from uh, the examples you've given that um, food manufacturing and packaging could lend itself to this. If you can automatically wrap and package items, uh, it doesn't need to be food, but I, I can imagine there'd be a lot of hygiene and health benefits if you could. Um, with self-assembly, packaging might be able to wrap around products as soon as it comes off a manufacturing line. Is that something you've explored? Um, not specifically the food space, but packaging, certainly. Um, I think there's a number of things that we're working on that point to packaging, the smart ink scenario, 
Um, already, like heat shrinks is a, a big space in packaging. But if you can get it to have multiple states, not just the one direction and then static, but uh, on site or after shipping, that then there's a second state that's activated. And it's trying to de uh, design around the energies that you would meet so that it doesn't haphazardly unassemble itself on the truck or uh, you know, in some other environment. But certainly packaging is, is a ripe example for that. Um, taking advantage of both shipping and uh, volume and uh, differences between manufacturing and insight, et cetera. Yeah. But there's also the user experience side, and there's a lot of magic that uh, I think we're not really even talking about at this point because we're trying to be super serious. Uh, but that has a lot to do with it as well. As we're playing with this, this kind of spontaneous serendipity and excitement. and um, So we've seen a number of people coming to us based on that side. Uh, the novelty aspect and the excitement of packaging and uh, how people engage with these physical objects, yeah. yeah. Scott, have you done any work on um, to, to test the structural integrity of, mm. say, a Ford deprinted object as opposed to a conventionally manufactured object? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and the kind of secondary question to that is robustness, longevity, and, and more the material properties. And, I think the reality is we're maybe halfway to where we would like to be in material properties. Um, right now, in terms of repeatability, the materials will fold underwater. When you take them out, they'll start to unfold. Uh, it will never get back to the original shape. It'll kind of get 75% there. And if you dip it in water, it'll go again. Over time, it's degrading itself. And so we would like to make a set of materials that are single directional. Certain applications only want to fold one way. And then another set of materials that are bi-directional and extremely repeatable, um, and nitinol and um, bimeta bimetallic alloys and um, some other shape memory polymers, et cetera, I think are closer to that domain. Uh, but the reality is that we're not arguing our 4D printing work is exactly what will be implemented. You know, Many applications are not going to utilize massive farms of Connex multi-material printers or the exact polymer composition. I think it's more the vision that um, very simple production means and very simple, simple plastics, not to mention woods, metals, foams, all the other ones, can have these type of very precise behaviors. And so we're trying to say we could, this is one way to do it and that we would like to work with people in many other industrial applications with other processes to have the same, same effect with other materials, other industrial set settings, yeah. Question. Uh, you know, we supply chain guys are always challenged with uh, reducing costs. And a lot of that has to do with raw materials and components. So what, what is your uh, vision about the state of the art in terms of material substitution? Yeah, great question. And I have a few perspectives on that. Number one, um, I think the alternative, and again, the sportswear example is a great one, that forever the vision was if we could just make smarter shoes, so we'll put a lot of robots in and a lot of motors, sensors, computers, et cetera. And the problem is, number one, that's kind of dangerous. Number two, there's an assembly problem. Number three, cost goes way up. Uh, failure goes way up. So that never was really feasible. And so what I think we're arguing is that fundamental material compositions can be the same price. The materials that we're using are not any more expensive than printing in another way. Um, they can, so they're not cost prohibitive for sure. They're not assembly prohibitive because they're assembled in the same way that any other static object would be produced. And we're looking for other processes. We could do the same thing with lamination, weaving, knitting, extrusion. Uh, so therefore, assembly and manufacturing isn't more expensive. And they're far more robust and less failure prone because it's materials. It's not external mechanisms. So I think that's our vision is that materials can be robotics. Materials can have actuation sensing communication and they're super scalable and super cheap. Um, so we take that perspective and, and I think that's why uh, it's not cost prohibitive. The other side of it though is, is that people will say, well, we need to make a lot of development on material science in order to really get applications here. And, and part of that is true and some of those often you'll get a new material and then it's super expensive, so we can't implement it yet. Um, usually that, there's a curve and that will come down over time. But the other perspective that we take is what I've said previously, that 
you'll have macro scale materials um, that are abundant and all around us, and we can make them do smart things. Our colleagues in Stuttgart did the exact same strand that folds into text. They did ICD, which is the Institute for Computational Design, and they did it out of wood. So they take a strip of wood, and depending on the orientation and the grain direction and how they laminate it, they can get it to fold one way, another way, fold into custom angles, and they can get a piece of wood to fold into text. So that shows that everyday dumb materials, wood's a really smart material, but everyday materials can do super precise things, and therefore I don't think it needs to cost any more money. Yeah. Hi, Stefan Johansson from Sweden. Um, I was thinking about the future. Do you think it's possible to, to decide when the material will change? If I don't know, don't want to, to that happen the first time it, it come near heat or near water. If it could be the second or the third time or mm. when I need it. Yeah, the easy way to do that is to deposit multiple materials one, so we've, we've looked at depositing three, uh, dissolvable material, rigid material, and expanding material. So therefore, it's based on time, and the quantity of volume of dissolvable material you put in will give you a time change. So therefore, you know, if I put a large volume here, and I put a less or a smaller volume here, this is going to fold first, that's going to fold second, and I can orchestrate what's going to fold when. Uh, so that's one way. But there's also mechanical ways to do it. So we always look at there's material ways, there's geometric ways, and there's ways to uh, respond to energy. So the geometric way would be you do it mechanically. You have latches, you have something that it has to build up enough pressure that then it releases afterwards. And so you can time it like that. Um, that this one, the, the latch is weaker, this one it's a much stronger one, so this one's gonna take longer and it'll take less. Um, you could activate it by temperature. You could say only when it's hot water. So you put it in water. I have a heater on this side. I flow hot water across. This side's going to fold first. Anyway, you could do it many different ways. Um, but, but certainly time control is, is really important for a lot of applications. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm Jared Gensel from here at MIT. Um, having two young boys, uh, I sometimes purchase products for them that say some assembly required. Um, and sometimes that takes a while. I was wondering if you're only working on the extreme of self-assembly or are you also looking at easier assembly, either for humans or computers or you know, materials that can make it easier to assemble products and therefore lower the costs of doing that or make it easier, more, more user-friendly? Yeah, great question. I think the Ars Electronica project shows that where we built this long, super long strand. Uh, that one, we had to fold it by hand. So we're still reading out the instructions or, or basically feeling the instructions. You, you move it until it clicks into place and then it's done. You move on to the next one, it clicks into place. Um, and there are a few toys out there uh, or a few products out there as well that have something like that where the geometry and the material property are the instructions. And so we're certainly interested in that. How do we... I guess a bigger vision for us is how do we embed codes into materials so they help us assemble it? Or even if I'm assembling it, it can tell me precision, tolerance, constraints, orientation, uh, moisture control. It can have information in there that helps me build a smarter product or a more precise object. Um, so we're interested in that. And then we're also interested, as you said, in how they can assemble themselves for certain applications. Yeah. All right. Skyler, uh, uh, Daniel from uh, MHI. So I'm thinking about the capital investment life cycle for manufacturing, mm -hmm. right, where we put in these big pieces of equipment that last for a long time. And I'm trying to figure out how we start planning for these new manufacturing technologies. And I'm thinking about like Moore's Law, how you know the whole hardware industry s sort of plans around it. Is there anything like that, or do you have any suggestions for... You know, if I'm looking to put in a factory that I'm expecting to depreciate over 20 years, mm -hmm. good idea, bad idea? Hmm. Yeah, uh, good question. I think a lot of the processes that are already in manufacturing could be used in different ways. If you think about sorting, sifting, agitation, uh, filtering, 
orienting parts, all of these are in line with exactly what we're talking about. Um, and most of the solutions that we need in manufacturing or many other industries, we normally go to robotics first. We, spend, we throw a lot of money in mechanisms, sensors, and computing at it, and we solve it in a, in a sort of brute force mentality. I think over time, those become more and more elegant. And so, um, you know, our vision would be that you don't need a lot of new infrastructure to do these things, um, rather that you listen to the energies that we already have, whether it's sunlight, uh, gravity, so we use gravity-fed systems, or wind, or water, or these kind of scenarios that you already have, but it's sort of utilizing them in the right way. Um, so I, I guess the like far-term vision for us is that the environment around would be used as the energy source and the production means, it, and, and less and less super specific one-off, um, uh, let's say, robotic or uh, manufacturing machines, but more and more uh, activated energy to guide things in the right direction. So I, I, it's a bit vague. Um, in that sense, but I, I think it's much less about one-offs and more about universal and scalable energy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Andreas Barnes from the uh, Institute of Shipping Economics and uh, Logistics in Bremen, Germany. Um, I've got a question concerning your time saving. Um, you said as, um, that 3D printing, of course, takes a bit of time, especially if the structure is quite complex. Um, did you have any estimations um, how big the time savings is um, printing, well, by 4D printing compared to 3D printing? Uh, that's a good point. Um, so f our 4D printing is fundamentally using 3D printing. Uh, we're not using any new machines. We're using a new material, and it's, I think, a new thought process about how we make active printed structures. But fundamentally, we're, we're just printing. So the time it takes to print our structures is the same time it takes to print a dumb structure or a static structure. Um, so in that sense, it's the same. But if I wanted to print, um, a, let's say, that dodecahedron uh, versus if I print the plane, uh, we would certainly win because the time for trans transformation is much quicker, especially if you have to talk about post-processing. And, and that's another discussion that most people don't talk about in 3D printing, is you take your object out and it's almost never ready. There's this huge process of post-production. Uh, so when we print flat, we don't have that post-production problem, and we're transforming in real time where it's still going to be hours before it's finished. The other one. Uh, so I think that's that's a real advantage there. Um, but generally, so generally people will say, well, the time, we can never beat existing industrial processes with the time that 3D printing takes. Injection molding is going to kill it every time. Um, and so then they often go to the customization argument that, well, we can make customized parts or we can, you know, mass custom um, argument versus mass standardized argument. But my argument would be more about the actuation sensing and computing scenario that, you know, even if it takes more time, and even if you would say that per part is more expensive than injection molding today, if you um, add in all the time and cost that you would need for actuator sensors, computers, and assembly, human assembly, uh, or if you say for our dodecahedron structure versus one of our 4D print, the time it would take someone to hand assemble that or precisely assemble it with a robot arm, we would certainly beat it in terms of cost of labor for the human versus the part assembling itself. And we would definitely beat it if you t think about cost of this industrial robot arm that's going to be super expensive or one-off machine that's extremely expensive versus the part assembling itself um, using water. So I think time and, and cost is definitely going to win if the park can do it itself. Yeah. Anybody else have another question? Well, I have a question for you, Skylar. So um, is there a particular company, particular industries that mm. you're interested in working in where you think this technology, where it is right now, can be advanced even further? Uh, you know, this is kind of your wish list. What do you want? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, in the beginning, I have a background in architecture, and I would have thought, you know, construction is is great. That would be a perfect industry to work in, and and we're fascinated by the construction and um, materials and kind of macro scale manufacturing processes. Um, but then we got surprised by the companies that came to us when we released the 4D printing work. Uh, the sportswear was one of the first, um, more infrastructural, like water, electric, um, that space came to us, space, the space industry was really interested, um, medical and defense, obviously. So we, we've opened up that, that palette and um, we're interested in a wide range. And one of the most fascinating things for me is that the principles that we're studying, self-assembly, reconfiguration, replication, programmable materials, um, are very, very scalable. As long as you're dialed into the materials and the energy in the application you're working in. And so therefore, one of our focuses is trying to find companies in many different sectors with different scales of applications, either many, many parts or large parts or super specific structures, et cetera, with challenges and the vision that we have that we can do it a different way, that there's, a, there's another way to look at materials, energy, production, interaction. Um, and so in that case, we're interested in, in many different um, spaces and right now there's there's software we have software companies we're working with um, materials and printing um, infrastructure electrical infrastructure uh, we're looking at medical and, and pharma etc so you know it's across the board but for us it's how do we scale these technologies to many different domains uh, it strikes me that uh, well, uh, you're probably working with materials engineers mm -hmm. in companies, have you been working with logisticians at all, people in the supply chain domain? Uh, I haven't so much other than through the companies that we're working with. Let's say they, uh, a company will come to us and say, we see a connection between the technology you have and a challenge we're facing or a specific domain we're facing. And part of that conversation will be supply chain and distribution manufacturing, et cetera. And so the conversation will come in there, but not we haven't had it where it's only about that discussion, but rather that's one piece of a larger discussion. But yeah, certainly be interested in that. Well, I think that that makes sense. And for us today, I think the challenge is to think, how can this particular development enable our, you know, the end result, which I, you know, is best uh, de demonstrated by that flat surface that self-assembles into uh, you know, three-dimensional surface, and you can think about how much cheaper it is to ship a lot of flat things to the end customer and then have them activate that. Uh, so, you know, that has a big logistics aspect to it. So if there are no other questions, then I'll say thank you very much, Skylar, and it was a great presentation. Pleasure. So we're going to break now, and let's reconvene at 3.45 here for Professor Sanjay Sharma.